Okay, Mark. So let's talk about, there's a lot of things I want to talk talk with you about today, but summer scouting, it is blistering hot here. We just had tremendous storms yesterday. How are things out where you're at in Wyoming? <laughs> it's it's odd because all everybody I'm talking to, like you and other friends of mine around the country, are talking about heat. And we've actually had a very cool, wet spring, at least in my area of Wyoming. And I'm sure you've seen the national news, the flooding in Yellowstone National Park. Well, you know, Yellowstone is just across the basin from me. We go up one mountain range down into a basin and there's Yellowstone. Our mountain range, same similar situation. Lots of late uh, snow, spring snow and heavy snow. And then we had some really good rain on top of that with temperatures warming and it's created the flooding. Now we didn't have near what they had there, but we had an abundance of moisture and cool. In fact, yesterday or the day before there was snow forecast in the mountain and Saturday here again, there's still snow wow. forecast just right, right where I can see right out the window. Of my That's you know, crazy. So now. you're actually in a, you're actually in a pretty good bubble there as far as weather goes. We are, but, we, tomorrow and the next day it's supposed to be close to a hundred Oofta. and then it's supposed to dive back down. It's just, it's just crazy. Crazy. So. so, you know, I know one of your things, okay, we've known you for, well, I've followed your work for over 30 years. You've been a deer and deer hunting TV contributor for almost a decade. Um, what I know one of your fortes is scouting. How do you go about, I know you're a huge shed hunter. You do all that stuff. You probably get a lot of your scouting in while you're predator hunting as well. Um, summer, 100 degrees, are you doing much deer scouting? I'm doing some. I'm not doing probably as much as I, I would, you know, right before the season starts. But the key to summer scouting is just, you know, food. Just be out there on those good food sources that are starting to come up. And the... And right now it can be critical to get out there because the crops are starting to come up at the, the nipping stage that deer just love. So you, you're not going to see, say, you know, a five and a half year old buck is not going to look, you know, gigantic yet, but he's definitely going to start to have the shape character and, and form where you can say, yeah, that there deer, he's going to be a shooter. He's, he's something that we're definitely going to want to watch. So you can at least get an idea of where the bachelor groups are starting to hang, uh, where they're loafing, and what the potential might be on the future for it for a good buck. How is that differ? Because I know um, where you're hunting, you know, Wyoming, Montana, the Dakotas, Oklahoma, Kansas, um, primarily. I know you hunt all over the place, and you have hunted all over the place. What are some of the key differences? Um, in that strategy, because I know in Wyoming, uh, where I've hunted, and you know where I hunt, um, you'll see 10, 15, 20, 30 bucks in a field, and you won't see that here. You'll, you, you know, when you get to the upper Midwest, you get to the south, the southeast, even the northeast, um, those guys might be lucky to see a couple bucks, you know, in the field. So, what are some of the di- what are some of those differences? Because I know your deer are probably more nomadic than they are other places. Does that change your strategies? It it can change it a little bit, but one thing I think, regardless if you're scouting in Alabama, Illinois, uh, Eastern Wyoming, wherever, is you definitely gotta be aware of what's going on in your backyard, meaning what changes are, are occurring in land management. It may be nothing at all, but say you're on the edge of the Great Plains or where I hunt in South Dakota, for example, they rotate crops. They rotate crops in your backyard. They rotate crops a lot of places. You may have what you believe is the best food plot in the world going. You know, you had some good rain. Now you got some warm weather. Things are coming up. But if the neighbor down the road, the, the farmer or even a, a heck of a land manager has changed up his food plot or all of a sudden put in a half section of soybeans, that can just throw chaos into, into your summer scouting. So you got to be really aware of those situations. Uh, just recently here in, in my, literally in my backyard, I've got a, a cool thing going on and it happens every other year, sometimes every year, but usually every other year. And that's because it's so lush, the white tails are leaving some creek bottom below me about a mile to two miles below me. And they come way up. I live in the, up in the sagebrush and 
some high sagebrush country. And those white tails are coming way up here. So like this morning, for instance, I was seeing white tail bucks and mule deer buck bachelor groups within, you know, 300 yards of each other out feeding and stuff. So that can make you think, man, I should be hunting, you know, that, that draw right there. But at the same time that when, uh, when fall starts coming on, those deer are going to move right back down to the creek bottom. So, uh, you, you can't just base everything on what you see at that given time. At the same time though, say September and you're wanting to hunt your little food plot and your, your trail cameras all summer long aren't showing a whole lot, but down the road you're seeing, Oh, all of a sudden there's seven, eight, nine bucks on that soybean field. You may want to wait with your food plot hunting just a little bit until, oh, say late uh, September, early October, when those soybeans leave the field down there and those deer come back to your little piece of heaven. Now, how have things changed scouting wise? Um, I know back in the day, you you wrote some books, you wrote a lot of articles about all the different tools that you used. And back then it was getting maps, getting aerial photos and things like that. I know you rely heavily today on some of these apps on your phone. How are those helping you with your summer scouting efforts? Uh, hugely. <laughs> I use the hunt stand hunt hunting app. And uh, one of the things I really like that is their monthly updates. So I don't even have to be at a place, for example, and I can kind of get a sense of what's going on. And I hunt a lot in Kansas, as you guys know, and we, we run a lot of those hunts over the years. And uh, with that, it's with that monthly update, the image isn't as high of resolution, but I can zoom in at least and get an idea. Did this farmer change something up? Is this a field being uh, tilled up and they're going to replant it in alfalfa this year? is uh did a wildfire occur that you know i wasn't aware of so every month i'm able to get a monthly preview of what's going on in places i never hunt works good for here uh in wyoming same thing especially as we're going to be getting more into wildfire season and and like the places i hunt in eastern montana they're really prone to wildfire so i may hear about a wildfire i may not but i can zoom in and get a monthly update that's one of the things i really really appreciate it. that is awesome that. that is awesome i mean we can't i can't even think of going back 25 years and imagining you know where we've come because you did it i did it went to the library maybe ordered some aerial photos that might have been 20 years old you know just to kind of put yourself in the ballpark we did that doing public land but uh, that this takes things pretty much to a brand new game you talked about mule deer that's actually something i wanted to talk to you about because we do get a lot of questions on it, especially guys who want to travel. But um, one thing that I learned, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in those states like where you live and they have whitetails and mule deer, if you're a whitetail hunter and you see mule deer, should that concern you? Because what I was told was that they're kind of they kind of live segregated from each other, and that whitetails will either dominate mule deer or if mule deer in one are in one area you're not going to really see the whitetail numbers is that true it's it's true to an extent but but you do see a lot of sharing of habitats uh overlapping habitats hay fields they're a big overlapping habitat the, the whitetails they'll stay in the creek bottoms rivers visit hay fields that are right there they just pop out of the willows and such uh, where the mule deer will maybe come out of the foothills, transition out of there down to the hay fields. And what I typically see is white tails are a bit more aggressive and more dominant on the mule deer. Now, that's not always the case. I've seen it vice versa, but but I have seen that. Now, are white tails taking over mule deer country and pushing them out? I don't know if that's so much the case when you start looking out the nitty gritty or is the fact that mule deer country is changing and there's a lot of changes i mean i, I could name a dozen right off the top of my head but is mule deer country changing enough where whitetails are finding it more of a place to be at home and mule deer like pronghorn animal uh, pronghorns for example are more niche specific they they have a very narrow niche of type habitat that they can survive in you don't see pronghorn antelope in new york you know but you see white tails in New York and you see white tails almost to the West Coast now. And it, well, in fact, there are white tails all the way to the 
grass toes. So whitetails are very adaptable. Mule deer are not quite as adaptable, and that's probably where it's coming into the struggle. And you're seeing more of these uh, uh, whitetails moving from spot to spot, and mule deer numbers going down, down, down. And uh, it's it's such an important and uh, big thing right now that the, there's a mule deer uh, group combined of all the wildlife agencies that have mule deer in their states, and, and, and they meet, and they don't really have a lot of bright news coming out of that group right now. That was my question for you. In your view, what is the future uh, of mule deer and mule deer hunting in America? Uh, in my view, I... I don't, I'm not optimistic. I think mule deer on private ranches particularly are doing fairly good, but I feel like on the public lands, they're getting probably pressured too much for the state that they're in, that it's too much pressure for a lot of them uh, to overcome right now. Big private ranches that have controlled hunting, I still see a lot of good mule deer numbers and some fairly decent bucks out on public lands. And I'll give you a good example of the Bighorn Mountains in my backyard. I do a ton of uh, shed antler hunting in those mountains. When I started, you know, uh, when I moved out here, getting close to two decades now, but um, we'd always pick up mule deer sheds, old ones, fresh ones. You know how many mule deer shed, fresh sheds I picked up in the mountains this year? Well, I'm not going to guess. None? Oh None. my gosh. Wow. And I cover a lot of miles. That so, much, uh, I, I know you cover a lot of miles. None. Wow. And last year, I picked up two fresh sheds in the mountains. And the year before, maybe two or three. They're oh just, uh, the numbers are just not there. You see you see mule deer, but the problem is, and when I'm elk hunting up there, the problem is they're just, there's, there's, it's, oh, there's a lot of problems. <laughs> there's too much pressure. Because every two by two mule deer you see is strapped to the back of an ATV. So they're getting shot. So they're just not, they're, you know, they get to, they get to two and a half, maybe three and a half years old and they're headed down the mountain to Wyoming, back to Wisconsin, huh. Michigan, wherever. Is, you know. is it more the pre, uh, hunting pressure then rather than the habitat change? Or no, I, I think there, it's habitat change as okay. well. So Okay. What now? Uh, the, the the other question. Somebody actually asked this to me, and that was why I put this question on the list. Plus, I know you know a lot about mule deer. But, um, what would the five best locations be to if somebody wanted to travel out there? Even though you're saying it's you don't you don't want to see too many people killing mule deer uh, from out of state. But if I want to take an out of state hunt, where would I go to, for a trophy mule deer? Um, w let me clarify that this is a region, so. Right. There's mule deer around in certain spots, in Wyoming, and Wyoming would rank high. You know, well, there's only so many states to have mule deer in, so Wyoming is going to be tossed in there. I would probably at first, you know, if I was right off the bat, I would probably think about Colorado. Colorado's mule deer country for the most part, from border to border, border to border. It's uh, it's has the most Boone and Crockett bucks, so your chances probably are higher. Even though a lot of those came from the heyday of the 50s and 60s, but um. Fairly easy to get a tag yet. In almost every mule deer state, you have to apply yet though. There's just very few over the counter opportunities. There's uh, Western South Dakota has an OTC archery tag yet. Nebraska has an over the counter tag that can be used for mule deer in certain areas. But you know, you're really good states like Colorado, you're gonna have to apply and get some points. And uh, some of those points you might be able to cash in in a year, two or three, some of them, a little bit better uh, units, probably seven to 10 years. Wow. And then I, uh, uh, Idaho, again, another good state, probably overlooked even. And uh, they've got a license. Uh, again, you have to apply. And it's kind of a, I believe it's a first come, first serve is how you get it, uh, get in line, get the tag. But um, again, you got to apply. Lots of public land. Colorado, same way. Lots of public land. That's why I, I like those states. Uh, Montana. They've got a similar thing going on at Wyoming. Some of their numbers are good. Some are not so good. And uh, I would say that uh, the very eastern part that used to be a hot spot, the public lands along the Missouri River and stuff, probably isn't as good as what it used to be. But you can still, you can still find a buck there. And uh, the southwest maybe is, would be a good place to uh, hunt mule or southwest Montana. Although the northwest I'm not hearing a lot of great stuff on lately. So, uh, uh, Wyoming, 
I believe if you're a hardcore hunter, you can kill a monster mule deer in Wyoming yet over on the Western half, the Western tier. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, but it's a rough, rough country, but they do allow rifle hunts in uh, alpine zones, high elevation zones in the early season, September. So that'd be one to look into. Then after that, uh, Arizona's good, Nevada's good, Utah's good. But again, you have to draw points there and uh, and, and kind of know the very you know specific niche units you want to go after. If you're going to draw if you're going to put in and buy a lot of points i would suggest to to uh save up as much money as you can and go with an outfitter possibly yeah it's especially if you don't live there you don't have time to scout and maybe not in the best shape yeah so, that's uh, probably makes the most sense i would say especially that that surprised me i guess it shouldn't but i know elk hunting is probably that way seven to ten years to get a deer tag my goodness i mean like in colorado that you said um, that leads me to my next question, which would be just deer hunting in general. And I call everything west of Wisconsin West, but like every place where you hunt, the Dakotas, like I said, Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, Kansas, Montana, uh, has for non resident hunting, has to me, it seems like it's gotten insanely expensive, uh, especially for tags and especially for some of these draws. Do you think that it's gone too far or do you think that we're not even there yet? Well, I don't think we're there yet as far as price. I think it's going to keep going up like uh, gas prices are in your hometown. But yeah. I do think it is getting a little uh, a little bit high. It's getting, I mean, right now is a crazy time we're in. Uh, yep. When this podcast airs, we're in the middle of the craziest inflation in 40 years. So everybody's going to be strapped, but that, but the average guy, say the average guy, uh, again, coming out of Ohio or somewhere wants to go out West. And even in, even in some of the Midwestern deer tags are getting expensive, you know, to lay out five, 600, a thousand dollars to get that tag. Like the Montana combo tag deer elk combo is 1100 bucks. We get a chance at two critters, but yep. that's still a lot to shell out. That's not even the hunt. You know, if you go on an outfitted hunt, that's probably going to be a minimum anymore on a deer hunt, 3,500 probably yep. at the lowest for a good deer hunt. And now you got to get and, out there, get out there and stay and, gotta, and all that. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, I do think, I know wildlife management costs, uh, don't get me wrong there. I'm not going to, I'm not ever going to bad mouth the wildlife agencies for that thing. And it's going to cost a lot in the next year or two with all the prices and fuel. You can't get to places to manage wildlife without driving somewhere but uh but you we really got to look at that is can the average guy handle that little incremental jump every two three four years and uh and another thing that happened out is happening out west here too that's kind of been trending and is the fact that uh a lot of these states are looking at limiting the amount of non-residents coming in especially for some of their you know, they're really cool hunts like sheep, elk, and uh, uh, bison or whatever. They're going to give the residents more of a chance. And these guys then, and I'm one of them, you know, I've been buying preference points. And all of a sudden now I've got 15 preference points, say in Colorado or whatever, and they're not going to be worth as much because there's a fewer amount of tags to draw. So that puts me back even more years. And I'm at the point where you know, I can't wait too many more years to go sheep hunting or <laughs> I won't be able to get there. So, I don't uh, think you have but, to worry about that, but. <laughs> but, it, but I mean, so there's a lot of little things going on. They're adjusting. Montana just had a big change in the way they divvy out elk tags. Uh, and people are a little bit upset about that. They get more preference points, preference options to people that are going guided. So uh, all these things. And with the price going up, yeah, I think we're getting to the edge where we got to really think about, can the average, you know, blue collar guy go do this, can and, go out hunting, you know? And that's how I should have prefaced, prefaced it was the average blue collar guy, because as you said, this is not a complaint against the state. You work for the state of South Dakota, right? For I, yeah, I was a state government employee for 14 years. So I understand they've got to do their jobs. They have to figure out ways to pay 
for their programs, their management, all of that stuff. But like you said, on a especially on some of these states, a white tail tag is seven hundred and fifty dollars or you know, something like that. For a white tail tag. And the one that got me was I think a doe tag. You can correct me if I'm wrong here. A doe tag in Wyoming was I can't remember I it seemed like a lot. And I'm like, aren't they trying to manage these deer? You know, I mean, it'd be like, it was, maybe it wasn't why I'm like, it, it was a couple hundred bucks. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me to shoot a doe. It could be. You know? Yeah. Um. So anyways, that's. That, that should be, that should be almost a giveaway. You would think. Not quite. But, you would You think. know, like 25, 50 bucks, something like that. You want to bring because a deer home. All, yeah. Yeah. And nothing wrong with shooting does. I mean, I'm all game for it and everything. But you're right. That's that's a straight up management move, so people can help manage the numbers and fill the freezers. So, yeah, man, why why are we fighting that fight? That's that's like I said, not to complain. To me, it just it seems like that stuff is going up and it's squeezing out. I mean, I knew guys growing up that they would go once a year. They would take a trip, X Y Z, and it it was you know like you said, you had to save up for it, put a little away every week out of your paycheck, and you could do it. It seems like a lot of guys have been squeezed out. Matt. Okay, guys, we're going to take a break, and we're going to show some love for one of our sponsors, and that is Hunt Stand. I've been using this for a couple of years now, and I'm not a technology guy, but this is extraordinarily helpful. It has really taken my hunting game to the next level, especially for scouting and especially understanding how deer are behaving the way they're behaving on a particular week or month on the properties I hunt. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. There's so much packed into this app. I'm not going to be able to tell you about them today. You're just going to have to take a look at it for yourself. I have the hunt stand pro version. There's two, two segments here that are extraordinarily helpful. The one, I mean, there's a lot, but the one is the property info. Yes. There's a lot of apps out there with property info. This one will show us precise, property lines and this is especially important when you're hunting near small uh, on small properties and near public land that's just one example the big one that i use there's two actually one is called the hunt zone this one has saved me many times basically is it's a zone that you put over the top of your hunting property it will show you real time how the wind is affected or how the wind is blowing predominantly on that particular day the weather is is really nice because it's going to tell you the barometric pressure the wind visibility gusts cloud cover precipitation humidity that's big but also you can go to there's a so lunar um, tab it will tell you sunrise moonrise overhead moonset and it actually gives you peak activity times very helpful and you can plan that out through the week so if you want to make the most of your hunting adventures, download the Hunt Stand app right now. You will not be disappointed. You can find it in the App Store or go right to their website, huntstand.com. Let's talk about uh, predators too, Mark. I know you do a lot of predator hunting, and this kind of goes with the whole management theme on whitetails. I know it's different. Again, everything's different when we're comparing where we live and where we hunt to where you live and where you hunt. But the question kind of comes up is as a predator hunter, does it make a difference in shooting his number of coyotes or is that just taking a bucket of sand out of the beach um, as far as management goes for deer? It, It depends on the approach you take. If you do it like I do where, uh, and I'm, I was, I'm literally probably just a day or two of going out for my first summer hunt. But if you just go out for fun on the weekends, occasionally every other weekend or whatnot, yeah, you're just, you're just, it's not, <laughs> you know, <you're> just, <laughs> cause coyotes are very resilient and, and study after study has shown that you take one coyote out to move in or another one moves in. And if you take too many out, the litter size increases. So the females have a way to counteract that. They, they understand that. But if you are focused on really getting a, uh, a good predator kill on a property, say again, say you're not the blue collar guy, you're the white collar guy, you've got a 
job running uh, some big data company in California, but you own a nice hunting property in Illinois or wherever, and you've got a guy managing that. And that guy is good at predator hunting and trapping. He's doing year round management on predators. You can make a difference. You can keep those numbers down. You can keep them at a so-called manageable level, but it takes a lot of work. It takes someone going out a couple of times, two, three times a week. If you're on a trap line, you know, or depending on the laws, but every other day you got to be ch checking traps. So uh, the trapping would be the big key to that. Calling them in with uh, predator calls, you're going to kill a few, but you definitely would have to uh, implement a, a hardcore trapping program, at least in my mind and the other, some of the other professional coyote hunters I've talked to, if you want to keep that kill down. Now, in my area of Wyoming here, the county actually hires crews to go out and fly and kill aerial kill coyotes. Oh, wow. I didn't so, know that. So it, it, I actually don't do a lot of my coyote hunting right here in my backyard. <laughs> right now I will, you know, as the pups are coming out of the den, if I want to get my decoy dog on them. But in the wintertime, the first good snow, they're out here just, they're slaying them, get them down. They're hammering uh, them. Wow. Yeah. So do they do hard to call a coyote. Do they do that type of predator management on any other species other than coyotes? Basically coyotes. But it depends, again, every every area is different. Some of them have done it on bobcats, I know, in the past. You know, years ago, they used to do it on red fox when red fox numbers were real high uh, back in sheep country. But um, uh, here it's basically just coyotes. And obviously not wolves. Uh, you can't shoot a wolf. Yeah. So you guys have a problem, uh, well, I should say Wyoming has a problem, like we have in the northern part of our state with timber wolves, they have a problem, I know, in, um, it w I guess it would be northeastern Wyoming with uh, mountain lions. Um, is there anything being done there, or is that pretty much kind of like a wolf situation where they, they don't really get to do much about it? Well, we hunt mountain lions hard here. Every every different unit, it's like it's just like elk and deer units. When you look at a map of Wyoming or Montana or or whatever state you're looking at, but they uh, they set up quotas per per uh, unit. And uh, last year they filled up most of the quotas right here in my little oh. part of the world. So the mountain lions, you don't see many mountain lions here. I do see a lot of tracks, like in, when I'm in the mountains in the springtime. Uh, shed antler hunting in the snow you'll you see quite a few tracks because they're following the herds they're looking for the uh, sick and weak so they're living right neck and neck with the elk trying to you know figure out the next elk they can take down but it's not like it's crazy numbers here it's it's something that rarely comes up south dakota they've had a mountain lion problem and and if you just google it you can see some of the crazy stories they've had over there uh they now this has been a decade ago probably but uh, and they actually darted elk out of a helicopter so they could put a radio collar on them. And as the elk was going down in the helicopter oh above, gosh. a mountain lion came in and uh, clamped onto the neck of that cow elk going down. Wow. So that, that tells you maybe maybe there's a few too many mountain lions <laughs> in that area. They're just basically waiting, just sitting and waiting for, a, for an easy meal. And I know they we, can we, wreak havoc on them too. Yeah, we, we manage them well, in, at least in Wyoming. I can speak on that behalf. They're managed well. Uh, the quotas are checked every year to make sure that enough females aren't being taken. And uh, it's it's a resource like any other thing, whether it's, you know, ring neck pheasant or a mountain lion. There's, there's ways to manage them, and you just watch to make sure everything's going smoothly and it's not cr the population isn't crashing. So I know your history, Mark, but tell the Deer Talk Now listeners um, – exactly how you got started i know it wasn't your your career is pretty close to mine as far as the years it was mid to late 80s you got out of college um you went to south dakota state right moo you moo yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> so tell, tell, give it give us a brief snapshot on how you got started in this business well before that even i really had an interest in outdoors uh when I was six years old, I wanted a ring neck pheasant, stuffed ring neck pheasant for my room. That was my Christmas, what I wanted for Christmas. So I, I don't know how many kids really wanted a taxidermy mount at that age, but that's what I wanted. And then I started drawing wildlife and stuff. And then I started writing about it. And I did that through high school. And in high school, I started trying to sell some of it. 
uh, to the local conservation magazine in South Dakota. And I finally did. I actually sold some uh, images. I was doing a lot of photography. So in college, I couldn't decide game warden or outdoor writer, or, you know, newspaper outdoor writer. And I took both. So I, I've got a pretty good start in wildlife management as far as background and journalism. About halfway through, I went all journalism. I, I just felt that was the way to go. I, I could just see myself. One of the things I looked at was I could see myself making a little more money than the game <laughs> wars. Nothing, nothing gets game wars. I love that they're out there doing what they do. But And, uh, of course, I'm a newspaper writer. You probably yep, do I did it, time. too, yeah. They didn't make a lot of money either. Nope. But then I, I, got, I caught a break and was hired as a photographer for the state of South Dakota, and I interned for two summers. And, and I did a lot of outdoor stuff. I inter, interned for the tourism and game fishing parks, all outdoor stuff. And then I slid into a full-time position kind of as an assistant uh, to outdoor promotions in the state of South Dakota and made my way there. While I was doing that, I was selling stories already. I was already and made some contacts. Well, I was made a few more contacts in this bad job. You know, people like yourself, for instance, an editor would come in when you, uh, as editor of Deer and Deer Hunting or whatever. And uh, we talked, they'd see that, oh, this guy kind of knows what he's, you know, talking about. And I actually guided some people at that time, some of the editors on my own. So uh, for turkeys and deer and pheasants, whatever. And I hooked up with outfitters in the state, also give them promotion, took others to Mount Rushmore. After about, uh, well, I worked there 14 years. I was working just insane hours. I'd come home from work and at eight o'clock at night, roughly start freelance working till about one, two in the morning, sleep for about five, six hours, and then get up and go to my regular job. And I worked a lot of weekends on that regular job too. So it was just really some crazy time there where I didn't really get a lot of sleep and I should have bought Mountain Dew stock, which I didn't do. But, uh, anyway, long story short, I finally got the point where I figured I could full-time freelance uh and uh i've been doing that ever since for almost a couple decades now i it's suppose it's been a few years and then you got off into television we know i mean you were with north american hunter hunting club and you did their tv show one of the things that i find fascinating is you've you've hunted all over you've basically shot every big game animal there is somewhere along the way you have had to have, you probably got a lot of crazy stories that we could fill up hours with, but do you recall one, because I ask everybody this, we're calling it Deer Camp Stories, one story that was either, it has to be memorable, obviously, but maybe it was harrowing, maybe it was funny, um, something along the way that really sticks out um, on one of these trips you were on over the past 30 years. Any species? And sure, <laughs> we'll, we'll go any species. I mean, I've had a lot with deer, but probably the craziest one I ever had was I was in Alaska with a rifle company, moose hunting, and our camp, our the guide, so-called guide, and there was a camp helper there too. The guide drank and did drugs all the time, and so he was always high and he was always angry, and he would he would just didn't want to guide us, so I went with the helper. And we spotted a moose and the, the helper said, I don't think I can let you shoot it because there was a 50 inch minimum. So we, so we went back to camp later that day, we brought the guide over and he said, no, it's not a 50 inch moose. Well, it was all a 50 inch minimum. He just didn't want to do the work of me shooting it and packing it out of there. <laughs> so the next, like this is going on a few days later and we had gotten our air to ground radio. Uh, through there was actually another helper in camp and he radioed to a beaver flying over and said you got to come in and get us out of here this guy's crazy uh clients are mad and uh the message got out well that that was the day before so the next morning i got up and i glassed a moose way off i could just see its paddles you know glistening in the sun miles away but i could tell it was a big bull and i uh, and the guide um uh i went Let's see. Well, even before that, we asked, we asked him, you're going to get up and make us some coffee. We were yelling tent to tent. And he yelled uh, real loud and clear. I mean, it was a clear message. F you. <laughs> so I figured we weren't getting coffee and I wasn't going to be able to go hunting with him. So then I went out, spotted this moose and I come back and said, 
uh, I didn't even talk to the guy. I told my buddy, I said, you want to go with me? And he goes, no, my ankle's hurt. So there was an 18 year old camp helper. And he went with, me. we went over, had several, let's see, one, two, at least three brown bear encounters on the way over, got run up on a rock by brown bears, but I killed the move, <laughs> cut it up, deboned it. And I moved the head way up into the tundra and stashed it. But the, you know, there's hundreds of pounds of meat. So I moved the good meat away from the carcass and wrapped it in a blue tarp and left at dark, covered in moose blood. We had to go through all this brown bear country, uh, alder tunnels and everything. Luckily, we didn't get eaten up. We get back, you know, it's well after dark, even though there is a glow, you know, just like everywhere in the North Country, it stays fairly light. We got back to the camp at dark. No one's there. <laughs> the, the, out, the real outfit had flown in and grabbed everyone and left. So here I am in the middle of Alaska uh, with this 18-year-old juvenile delinquent, which I later found out he was a true juvenile delinquent. That's why he was there trying to get his life back. And, uh, but they had left us a 12-pack of Coke and some Mountain House meals because we were out of food, too. Oh, my and, God. Uh, anyway, long story short, the next morning I got up, looked across with the spot and scope, and there's a giant bear covering the blue tarp. <laughs> burying it caching it and there was bears surrounding everywhere we were seeing six to nine brown bears a day anyway during the hunt it was uh a, it was an area that funneled brown bears down to a refuge area where they, they they spent a lot of time so uh luckily late in the afternoon an, another beaver flew in and there was the good outfitter and he said hey we need to get you out of here uh, he dropped off two more kids and they were going to help the other juvenile delinquent go get my head and everything. And uh, I flew out and went home. About two months later, I get my uh, moose head back. They had cut right through the burrs, tied them together with duct tape and <laughs> shipped them back. <laughs> they didn't even cut below, you know, like where a moose would naturally shed, just right through the burrs. So, oh, my. Okay. We have to have some kind of that. That gets the trophy. That you 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 are now in the leaderboard by far. Oh my gosh, what a story! Holy cow! Can I add one more? Oh, one absolutely. More Keep going. This there. is fascinating. So we we're laying there trying to shoot this moose, and we had no food. We had actually run out of food the day before. All I had was a packet of uh, dry uh, cheese, uh, dried cheese powder for macaroni and cheese. I used to pour on it, and I've been eating blueberries. And I'm laying there and I thought, God, I'm hungry. I'm just starving. You know, the blueberries weren't doing anything. So I ripped that packet open and just dumped it down my throat. Well, have you ever dumped dry powder down your throat? Your throat constricts. And I went in. I literally couldn't breathe. I thought I was going to die right there. So that, that kid, he's digging water out of my backpack. I finally got my throat cleared. But I honestly, I thought right there, that was it. I was going to choke to death laying in the... Choke to death uh, surrounded by grizzly bears. Surrounded by <laughs> grizzly bears with a moose that wouldn't stand up at that point. Shoot him. We were waiting for him to stand How up. How big was that, that moose, by the way? Uh, he was... um, What was he? 60, almost 62. Oh, my gosh. Oh, he's up. That's him? Dang. Nice. <laughs> a buddy of mine... Uh, a taxidermist, he rebuilt him for me. That's a whole other story, but that skull came courtesy through a long series of stuff through uh, Sarah Palin's dad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Actually, that, that's a skull he supplied for, for that because I didn't have a skull. You know, they just sent those uh, cut they, up. they basically cut the antlers off above the burr. Oh my God. That is an awesome story. What year was that? Uh, 2000. Uh, or early 2000s. Now, was that a TV well, hunt, or were you just you, were you just out there hunting? Just a uh, magazine hunt, you mm -hmm. know, right? It was with a, a rifle company uh, that I'd gotten to know, and they took me along for a mags, you know, get get all the material for a magazine article. Sure. And, wow, that is an unbelievable story. I've heard I've crazy. heard some good stories, but that one that one takes the cake by far. I mean, I can I can um, assimilate. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, you were talking about the guy who's a drug addict and stuff. Now, not not nearly to that level, but I went on a hunt in Maine, the one I talked about a couple of weeks ago, and um, we were in tents, staying in uh, you know a, a real deer camp with tents and wood stoves and all that stuff. And um, the guy that was my 
tent mate. Um, I wake up, the, I was apple cheek, 27 years old, one of my first hunts. And I wake up in the morning and the guy's sitting on my cot. I went outside to take a leak. I come back. He's sitting on my cot smoking a cigarette. And I had like my scent lock clothes all laid out and everything. I'm like, what are you doing? And he just takes a drag and goes, ah, that doesn't bother those deer. And I'm like, all right, thank you. But it wasn't a drug addict who I was like, you know, shackled away in Alaska with. That's that's something else. Gosh. Oh, man. Okay, where do we go from there? Let's try to get one more topic in here, Mark. Um, we, you, talk, you do a lot of rifle hunting for us. You do a lot um, of educating, um, especially with ammo. You know, Hornady is one of our sponsors. You've talked about the technology built in ammo. One thing I want to talk about, because you do it a lot, and it is pretty unique, I guess romanticized in the popular press and TV, Long range shooting. And, you know, it's a big topic these days, but I wanted to pick your brain on that as far as where is reality in line with some of the stuff that's out there today? Because I know you can go out there, you can buy, you know, best of the West rifles and ammo and all this stuff and have it. And you give it to the average guy, and it's like giving him a Lamborghini. Uh, does he really know how to use it, and is this really going to help him out? And this is something, personally, I believe people have to – they've got to experience it, and they've got to, they've got to be out and educate themselves how well they can shoot it. Because you're right. You can go buy the Lamborghini, but you might just drive out of your driveway and punch it once and flip it over in the ditch, and, you know, and it's just – You've, you've wrecked everything in a hunt situation if you don't know your limitations with that long range rifle you can wound a deer which is way worse in, in my mind you just never want to uh, be out there intentionally or unintentionally i guess it'd probably be unintentionally wounding a deer so it's something that so you go out there uh last year i i got a new rifle a bergara mg light it's a it's a um sporty lightweight rifle 300 wind mag shoots like a house of fire it actually i say this about all the rifles i have it actually shoots better than i i believe i can shoot so i test it and i've got a i've got a place in my pasture where i can test shoot it i try to figure out my limitations on that the gun is definitely a 1500 yard rifle for sure Dang. out thousand yards no doubt about it but is mark am i a thousand yard hunting shooter because there's a huge difference going out in my pasture on a you know a calm morning and i've got some targets our farthest uh, metal uh, target in my my uh, horse pasture is right at 700 yards i can ding that any day you know on a good day just just bam 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 with my 300 or my 65 three more but on a windy day jacked up on adrenaline with a deer sticking, it's just barely seen a little bit of its body out of the brush. All these things come into play during hunting that don't that don't occur necessarily at the range. So if you're gonna if you're gonna go the long range route, I, I truly believe you've got to get the best gear and then test yourself with that gear. And w- one of the ways I tell a lot of people to you know test their gear is, is to go out west or go out into a, a pasture near their midwestern home or eastern home or wherever and look for varmints try to shoot some do some varmint hunting in the off season and take some of those long shots on a on a live target it's not going to jack you up quite like a boon and crocker white tail might but uh but you're shooting a live animal that can move at any second at extended range and you're having to read the wind so uh so there's just so much involved there that people have to look at and then they've just got to say my personal limit is 900 yards. My limit is 600 yards. My limit is 1,500 yards. And 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 going with that, same thing is uh, understanding the ballistics of your of the caliber you're using. So say you're going to shoot a 243. Well, the foot pounds of energy hitting a, an extended range target is so much less than a 300 PRC that uh, you might be in a wounding situation, even though you can hit the deer. You might not get the, the the bullet penetration. It couldn't be might not even be the bullet's fault. It just does not have the energy to perform as it's needed at that range. So uh, 
lot goes into a lot goes into that long range shooting that I, and I think people just need to and, and write it right on their rifle buttstock, right on their dope card, no shots past 700 yards or, or whatever. But last year in elk season, I finally got into elk after um, it was the 10th day of the season. I had a 900 yard shot, 903 yards on, on a series of bulls up on a ridge. And it was just no way. I'm not going to do this. I, it was cold. It was snowy. Uh, I just, I, I just hiked several miles. My, my heart rate was way up. And uh, luckily another bull come in uh, a series of three, I guess there was three of them were closer under 400 yards. And I was able to make a shot on that one. But um, even though, my pasture, I probably could have made a 900 yard shot. Uh, that situation, I, there was just no way. I, I didn't even think about it. Just like, no, I'd have, I got, in fact, I was cutting the distance. I was starting to cut the distance from these other elk. And deer hunting, I always look for the out to get closer. And uh, your camera guys know that all the time. <laughs> they, they know <laughs> it. Always. They know it very well. I know it very well by watching the finished product. But uh, really good points that you make there. Something that we preach about all the time for archery and crossbow hunting, muzzle loading, you got to know, you have to know your limit. That's, that's key. But the thing that you brought up right here, which, you know, I think we all know, but I kind of forget about it, is you have, if you're going to get into that game, that long range game, you have to know what you're shooting. Like you said, you can, you can hit that target. You can hit that, that metal gong. But what is that bullet doing to a deer at six, seven, eight hundred yards? If if you're not that, yeah. if you're not shooting the the right bullet with the right gun, that's a great point. And by the way, um, you 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 were mentioning limits of like six, seven hundred. Yeah, about three hundred for me, <laughs> maybe on a good day. Um, and that and that to me, it's like I'm mostly a bull hunter, and and I don't think there's any shame in that if I even say two hundred yards because uh, a guy who's not used to that. The last thing you want to do, like Mark says, save up all that points and years of applying, get that tag of a lifetime, and go out there and then take a 500-yard shot, yard shot, which you've never done before, and then oh. wo wound a deer. And if you're with an outfitter, you're done because you drew blood. You don't, want, blood, yeah. you, you don't want to have that feeling. Um, you don't want to have that aftertaste. So that's something that's really important to, I think, emphasize. Yeah, I, I think just like you said, any weapon, always look for the close encounter, the best uh, distance that you can get. And and honestly, I'm I'm right there. You know, 300 yards, especially when you're filming, we that's a whole different game. But the camera's got to see it too. Right. So 300 yards is definitely what I always try to shoot for, and less. And uh, here's something I always I tell people. I've written about this a lot. I, I do a little bit of research on the military snipers and Chris Kyle, uh, American sniper. If you remember that movie mm -hmm. in the book, uh, most of his kills, when you read his book and, and the notes in there were 200 yards or less. So he, he wasn't exactly shooting people from, I mean, he, he made, you know, some extreme shots, no doubt about it. Vast majority. And he had a target rich environment, but the vast majority were what regular deer hunters would probably see like you said, as their longest shot, 200 yeah. yards. So, And 200, 300 yards sitting in a bean field and a deer's out there, that thing looks awfully small when you start looking at it through, a, through your reticle. So. Exactly right. Well, Mark, we have to actually get you back and talk more about this because you have way more insights than we could possibly get in today. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's, it's a pleasure to see you again, my friend. And I hope you yes. go, hope you guys have a great summer. And I would take some of that cool Wyoming weather, mountain weather for what well, for us right now. Uh, well, we'll see if we can send some there. I got a plan to go in the mountains in two days for sure. So uh, awesome. Um, wrapping up some office stuff right now. Awesome. Uh, but I appreciate being a guest. I always I just love you know hosting deer and deer hunting TV, being on the hunts and everything. So this. This was really special being on the podcast. Too. One thing I need to tell people is uh, Mark has done a lot of video with us. Just go to the YouTube page. Uh, it's YouTube backslash DDH online. Just type in his last name, Kaiser, and it's all going to come up. Uh, we've got literally dozens of videos. And Ian and David have been been there for most of the way um, filming these adventures, extreme adventures. All right, Mark, thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Appreciate it. 
That was awesome. The the story, especially with Mark about that moose hunt, um, incredible. Again, as we tell you all the time, if you're new to this podcast, if you're listening to it, just bookmark it. It's free. We upload them every week. If you want to watch the video versions, they're on our YouTube page, Facebook, everywhere else, or just go to deerandeerhunting.com for the landing page to find out what the topics are. For Mark Kaiser, I am Dan Schmidt. Thank you once again for joining us for Deer Talk Now. The Deer Talk Now podcast is brought to you by Cuddy Link Cell Cameras. Up to 24 cameras, one cell plan, and as low as $10 per month. 10 point crossbows, the fastest crossbows in the world. Wildlife Research Center's Scent Killer Gold. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. Full range hanging systems. The best way to display your shoulder mount trophies. Hunt Stand, the number one hunting and land management app. And Traditions Firearms. Feel the difference.